Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Chaluminati Podcast, episode 232, the final episode of 2023. As always, I'm one of your hosts, Mike Martin, joined by my beautiful brothers from L.A., Alex and Jesse. Hey! Whoa! There they are. Watch out! There those guys are. They look more similar every day. It is us. <laughs> Hello! Uh, it's the final episode before 2023 comes to an end, but how was your holidays, boys? What did you do? For, did you get? A, did you have a great Christmas? Did you get everything you wanted from Sandy? Yeah, Santa brought me a bunch of pickled stuff, which he he was a, he was a G for. I'm playing Super Mario RPG. What great. could be greater? That's pretty good, Jesse. I got lottery tickets and glasses wipes, so I'm doing great. Santa knows both of you very well. Yeah, I'm feeling feeling pretty good. That's that pragmatic Santa. Oh, I also got bubble gum and uh, apple snacks. So, like, you know. Can you can you elaborate on apple snacks? Dried what? apple snacks with cinnamon. Fried. What's up with what's up with old world Christmas presents? <laughs> what's up with like uh, like a tiny wooden horse with wheels instead of legs that you pull? What's up with that? What's up with like FAO Schwartz? I don't think people I don't think people are concerned about the quaintness of it anymore. No. Also, it's just what about like the square robot that like winds up that has the big knob on the back? Oh yeah, or like, the baby doll that goes mama mama. Yeah, I think. Their time has passed, and they are in the refuge of the damned toys now. And if anything's haunted, it's those. I watched a baby video, like not a baby video, but I was like a kid. It was like in the early '90s. I watched a video of of us having presents, and my cousin was holding a nut cra- like somebody gave him a nutcracker for Christmas. Kids love nutcrackers, <laughs> and I was like, "What? Like, am I like from 1915? Like- this is this is Alex. This is the core, the root of why you're so fascinated." With the 50s and 60s of America, you were propagandized at child from childhood on to love that era. That's true, though. Nutcrackers for Christmas. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm from the real like the South Bay, Los Angeles neighborhood of the South Bay is like that's the that's where it's that's the homeland. That's the homeland of all that. I remember as a kid looking at Nutcrackers and just being like, God, I'm so glad I'm not alive where the only thing that would be fun for me is a wooden Nutcracker. I got like socks, a Nutcracker, an orange. I, 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 will, I will say the thing that people forget, and you got to remember this. If you were born in the 80s, the place you lived wasn't this weird like 1980s vibe you see in movies or on TV shows, or even the 90s vibe. No, it was like leftover 60s. Yeah, yeah. It is leftover <laughs> yeah. 50 and 60s. Yeah. It's all the yeah. chairs your parents had from their grandparents, yeah. and it, everything looks old. <laughs> the walls are this weird yellow color. Everything, yeah. it, it also, the carpet was tacky the as shit. Was like, the the cra- carpet in yes. my bedroom was like green shaggy. <laughs> like yeah. that's yeah, what the carpet it never in my looked bedroom cool. Was. It, you no. always were basically still living in the fifties, except it was now thirty years later, and your parents who grew up in the fifties were like, "Well, I liked this cowboy movie, and so you here's a gun I bought you because cowboys are cool." And there's yeah. like, there's no people trying to figure out how to relate to you because <laughs> you're a kid in the eighties and nineties, and your parents are like, "When I was a kid, we shot stuff." You're like, "All right, cool, <laughs> okay." I'll do that. Yeah, I guess that's what I'm. That's what I'm. It's it's wild too because nowadays we're watching '90s fashion come back, and in the '90s, I remember when bell bottom jeans were like huge, and my mom was like, "I remember when those were popular when I was a kid." And but it was like the thing that was coming back in the '90s. My sister had bell bottom jeans and those low, like all that stuff from the '60s came back. Do you remember when PBS used to have those telethons where you'd like go and you'd like give whatever money you can and in return you'd get like a gift? A tote bag. It's a lot like patreon.com slash pod, which we do right now here on the show. Do we have tote bags? We, we Can we should. make tote bags? I think I think a legitimate like Chiluminati Foundation tote bag would be so like like perfect just like well, oh hold on hold on I'm, I'm funneling this energy directly to you guys. By viewers like you. By creepers like you. It's a UFO. It's a UFO Mm -hmm. on the side of the bag and the alien inside, right? Uh, He's like all happy because he's beaming up into the UFO books and groceries, the number one and two thing you put in those bags. Yeah. And then it can say like, for whatever your travels may need is something. I don't know. Workshop it. (laughs) Boom. I think that's the tagline of star tours. I'm not sure. I think it is. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, look at that. That's easy. Uh, I'll work on a tote bag for the Patreon. I'll see what I can do yeah. for that. I, I'll think, I'll start working that. Like brought to you, brought to you in part by stoners like you. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah, we, it's because of you guys that we get to do this. 
Uh, you said alien it reminded me, by the way, before I forget the thought, super short story. Another friend of mine, uh, the guy that I talk about when uh, the guy who was a Marine, the guy I've used, uh, you know, talk about a bunch of times, Jeremy, he, uh, I, went, I was playing games with him last night and he's like, by the way, I had this really weird, like UFO story. It's short. I don't know. It could be anything, but I figured I'd tell you. He was like driving from uh, for the holidays and he was back driving back to his apartment and he said he was driving and he said, it, this it, is recent. This is like three, four days ago. Recent. This happened uh, three, four days. This happened ago. like literally a okay. few days ago. He was driving and he said he saw something kind of uh, in the sky. It was a blue light that looked like maybe kind of like a bright star. He said it came down in a straight line. He said I wouldn't have paid it any mind except it came down in a straight line and then it turned at a ninety degree angle and took off over the tree line and I couldn't see it anymore. He's like it was maybe a. Is he aware that he started a, a country song? I wouldn't have paid no mind, but it came a straight line. <laughs> Right? Uh, I mean, write that down. Write that down. Dean, Dean, you're here to write that down. Came a straight line. Came a straight line. Yeah. He obviously was like, it could be, there's a, any number of things it could be, but he couldn't explain it. And I'm just mad because. Couldn't explain it at the time. <laughs> could have been a straight line. Could have explained at the time. <laughs> yeah. Alex actually has a country music Christmas album. So this is right up his alley. Yeah. I am a. It was four gray little men <laughs> and they came from my behind. <laughs> Black gold, Texas <laughs> shit, <laughs> shit from Saturn, <laughs> poop from Uranus. <laughs> I don't. Thank you to the sponsor of today's episode, Nuts.com. At the grocery store, you can get pecans, but don't you want bourbon pecans, sweet and spicy pecans, pecan brittle, or butter toffee pecans? If you're eager to try these, head to nuts.com to see the hundreds of different varieties of nuts that they offer. Cashews, almonds, pecans, pistachios, hell, dried mango, crystallized ginger, dates, jelly beans, jawbreakers, root beer barrels, and so much more. It's not just nuts over at nuts.com. The variety is huge. Nuts.com is your one-stop shop for freshly roasted nuts, dried fruits, sweets, pantry staples like specialty flowers, and so much more. Their wide selection means there's something for everyone. At Nuts.com, quality is their top priority. They roast their nuts and pop their corn the same day that it ships, so they reach you deliciously fresh, satisfaction guaranteed. And Nuts.com offers plenty of gluten-free options, organic choices, and other diet-friendly products. Whether you're looking for something sweet, savory, or need to stock up on everyday cooking essentials, you're bound to find something to try at Nuts.com. And right now, Nuts.com is offering new customers a free gift with purchase and free shipping on orders of $29 or more at nuts.com slash chill. So go check out all the delicious options at nuts.com slash chill. You'll receive a free gift and free shipping when you spend $29 or more. That's it, nuts.com slash chill. Thank you to nuts.com for sponsoring the episode. The uh, the uh, the year is coming to a close, boys. Chiluminati Pod is coming up on year six, starting in February. I don't know Ooh, if you're ready wee. for that. No we're big about to be deal. Six years old, which is best new artist. Yeah, we're the best new artists of 2024. Best coming breakout up. show 2024. One day, you know, we'll be a breakout hit. But until then, uh, I'm still going to do topics that nobody cares about. And since we're going into the new year, I want to do something a little bit lighter. We're not going to do any true crime. It's something I've been wanting to do for a while. Today, Good question, yeah. point of order. The listeners uh-huh. at home, could you go to either the subreddit or to Patreon or whatever, write down topics you do care about? Because I'm curious where that falls in line with <laughs> what Mathis wants to do. Because he's like, oh, you don't want to hear this. What do you want to hear? Listen, I'd love to know. Listen, in my reality, the only thing these pe- people want to hear about are aliens. So everything else. And, but that's, that's the thing. It's your reality, dude. What do people want right, to hear about? Exactly. See, don't, don't. This is not the uh, topic What haven't of the we talked about? What is, it could be like. The Mississippi Marsh Man. Like, you know, like maybe that's something we need. Dude, there, there probably is a Mississippi Marsh Man. Are you kidding me? There's probably like six of them. His name's Frank. Yeah, his name's yeah. Frank. He he runs a small bespoke sausage business. <laughs> and he goes noodling every Friday and Sunday. Hell yeah. Yeah, that's how he gets his good catfish. Yeah, shit's mm-hmm. a good guy. I, the, the idea of noodling for catfish sounds scary. It sounds like a jump scare waiting that's to That's the happen. ultimate Chiluminati video right there. Mathis going noodling for a catfish? Yep. Let's all let's all let's let's go. The boys go noodling. The uh, boys like, go noodling. Like, uh, it's always sunny. I just got to get yeah. you out of here to Texas. I bet you we could go noodling pretty easy. I bet you we could. I bet you. Who do you think of the three of us most likely to pull a catfish out of the water? 
Alex. Probably me, because it'll be attracted to my magnum dong. You, oh, you're going to noodle with your noodle. New tactic. You're just going to noodle with your dick in the beaver holes? <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah, brother. I'm about to noodle with my cock, man. <laughs> That's the real mystery. Is why haven't we been doing this in the first place? <laughs> that was that our- Being good tonight. Just like that catfish. <laughs> no, we're not talking about noodling today, boys. Or are we? <laughs> no, we're talking about ritual hauntings today, gentlemen. And if you don't are like, what do you mean ritual hauntings? I'm talking about things like sticking your dick in a noodle hole. <laughs> That's how ritual hauntings start. Let's be real. As the clock strikes midnight, you slide your dick into a noodling hole, and instead of a catfish, it's a succubus, and she comes out. Oh, my God. It's like a nature's glory hole. <laughs> it's horrible. It's horrible. You put Satan's that in my mind. Glory hole, but I'm, I'm mad at you for making me say that. I can't believe you did that to me. I didn't do... Listen, I'm just here to guide the conversation in the right direction. I'm okay? like Wilt the Stilt Chamberlain. You lay me up the shot. I'm putting it right in. I don't watch basketball. That's all right. What is this is basketball. No, I'm talking about Bloody Mary, Charlie Charlie, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, things that have been around for actually a long, long time. I know Bloody Mary. I have never heard of Charlie Charlie, and I am ready to find out. Okay, go back to 2013, 2014 on TikTok. The pe- the kids who put paper down and spin a pencil and just say Charlie Charlie, and then it'd be like something else I have to say, and it would go to yes or no. Are we just is making TikTok, this up now? Is TikTok but, even that old? Yeah. Time, uh, wait, it's 2016 t- then. I don't fucking know. Okay, hang on. Now, now you're going to make me Are Charlie we just making Charlie. Stuff? Like, this seems crazy to origin. me. I've never okay. heard of Charlie Charlie. I'm just saying. We're I, just I'm making excited. stuff up. I'm not making what it up. One of the days where it was Bloody Mary and that was it. I believe that we're going to get into it's it. It's not about, yeah, it's not about the powers of Juego de la Le- I don't know what the fuck that we Ouija board stuff. It's fucking internet. That's not what do you guys remember? Uh, do you guys remember? Uh, I got you where I want you, and now I'm gonna eat you. You guys remember no. that one? No, 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 no. It ends up being a guy on the toilet eating his boogers. I do remember yeah. it. Yes, he was coming. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's one of those like. Uh, it's like yeah. It's like not quite a bloody scary yeah, like, stories to tell in the dark. Yeah, it's not quite a bloody mary. It's not quite a ritual haunting, but it's like. Mm-hmm. I don't know. When I was thinking about Bloody Mary, I was thinking about that guy eating his boogers. Anyway. Cool. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. There's a huge <laughs> list of these like ritual style hauntings. So we're going to cover about five of them today, but there's so many more. So if you guys enjoy it, we can have always oh, do a part two of more of these things. And I figure we'll open up with the one everybody knows. Let's talk about Bloody Mary first. Yes. I imagine you both believe the uh, you both. BM. What do you uh, t- explain to me, Alex, what the Bloody Mary like ritual is, if you can remember <sighs> I don't know exactly. I know it involves going in the bathroom and there's a mirror in the bathroom. And this is at least the like child culture, like weird playground legend version that I used to do. Absolutely. Is we'd go into the bathroom and you'd light like a candle in the bathroom and you'd turn the lights on and off and you'd say Bloody Mary three times and she would appear in the mirror. That's vaguely the one I remember. Something, something like that. I don't know. If the, yeah. yeah, yeah. From when, from what I remember as a kid, it was like, go in, shut the lights off, say Bloody Mary three times and turn the lights on. And she's like in the mirror or something. I don't know if she's like, yeah, that's that's what I remember. But yeah, we've all had that in our childhood. And it comes. I remember my parents talking about it as that, uh, you know, when they were kids. It's a game that has over the decades kind of for kids, almost like a test of courage, uh, just a way to see how brave you can be in the dark. And a thrilling, like maybe potential brush with the paranormal at a time where, you know, as a kid, you're willing to believe so much. But what happens when the lights go out and all you're left with is the candles flicker in your own reflection in the mirror? Does that mean the ritual failed? Does that mean the ritual was real at all? We'll get into it. There stands an... don't 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 shake your head yet, Jesse. I pose questions only so that I can answer their... their Yeah, no, dude. You're just asking questions. Right. I'm just... I'm just Just asking asking questions. questions. Yeah, 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 Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So just imagine a scene... Out of every teenager's spooky sleepover, a bathroom draped in shadows, the only light coming from a quivering candle, there stands an intrepid or perhaps foolhardy child individual, their heart racing with a mix of fear and excitement, and in front of them, a mirror, an ordinary object by day, but now, in its ritual's embrace, a portal to something unknown and possibly sinister. The rules of the game are simple and unnerving. Stand before the mirror, gaze into your own eyes, chant Bloody Mary three times or dare to go further and say it 13 
And then 13. Once, yeah, that's a new one as well. That's a new one for me as well. The air then becomes thick with anticipation. And with each repetition, the atmosphere grows denser. The shadows seem to creep closer and the familiar becomes unfamiliar and foreboding. As the final invocation of Bear- Bloody Mary slips from your lips into the darkness, a moment of eerie silence ensues. Will the spectral figure of a bloodied woman appear in the mirror, her eyes hollow, her expression vengeful? Or will it all be a moment of heart-pounding suspense, followed by a relieved, nervous sigh and laughter? Put some spooky mood music onto that, I think. Yeah, but spooky music. Spooky mood. What kind of what kind of music would you suggest? Like <sighs> royalty free, royalty free for one. You know, oh, so is it gonna be there. that one that always plays on TikTok? It's like everyone knows that one. The one's like I. You sound I don't like know. Benny from the Mummy trying to get the Mummy to get away from him by <laughs> adding extra prayers. <laughs> <laughs> he has got all the different what necklaces. What the fuck was that song? There's a song that plays every time there's a spooky video on on TikTok. It's like, yo, yo, yeah. I don't even know. I don't know. You know, I'm telling you, every song, every time there's like a video of like you're underwater and you know like a big face is gonna come get you. There's always in the back. It's like, yo, yo, yo. Why do you sound like the Mothman, like crooning at a at a, at a nightclub? <laughs> Just telling you, I didn't make this up. Yo, yo. <laughs> I didn't make this up. It's what it is. What, what is happening? Spooky. What the fuck? No, I'm this telling is you, it's like, just our yo, Jesse ritual. I think. Yo, <laughs> I mean, yo, I think, yo. <laughs> Jesse just sees music of o- like videos of ocean and does that music himself. I'm telling you. Or if like a planet, it does like a planet coming to Earth, and it's like POV in the background. It's like. Oh, yeah. It's like say la vie on my <laughs> I don't know what's happening anymore. <laughs> the, this is a, the, the, the ritual of chaos has succeeded. Uh, Jesse, you're gonna have to send me some of those TikToks so I can know what what's the fuck supposed to happen about? with Bloody Mary. What? Yeah, can we just get back to when Bloody, Bloody Mary? Mary shows up, is she supposed to kill you? Well, let's keep talking here. There's more for to this. We're going to get to more details. I always was so afraid that it was really going to happen, but I don't know what she was. My understanding do when she as a kid there. was that she would kill you if she saw you. Like that's what Just I thought would happen. To you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She'd murder your ass. Yeah. So why are we doing that then? Why are we calling Bloody Mary to come kill spooky, us? Spooky dude, it's spooky. It's spooky dude. Yeah, this spine tingling game, often played by daring kids during sleepovers, involves standing in a dimly lit bathroom, doing that whole mirror thing, invoking her name. The practice that has both terrified and intrigued kids for generation. But where did this ritual ritual originate? Well, the bl- name Bloody Mary resonates with historical gravity, most notably tethered to the legacy of Mary I of England. Mary's reign in the mid-16th century remains one of England's most tumultuous periods. Her ascension to the throne in 1553 was a reversal of the Protestant Reformation that had begun under her father, Henry VIII, and her half-brother, her brother Edward VI. Mary, who was a devout Catholic, embarked on a zealous mission to return England to the Catholic faith. This religious crusade led to the Marian persecutions, where hundreds of Protestants were burned at the stake for heresy. The brutality of these acts painted her five-year reign in strokes of blood, earning her the posthumous title Bloody Mary. So that's where in history the name first pops up, and it's because of just her horrendous actions for her short five-year reign. We don't know, but we don't know if that's supposedly the same Bloody Mary or what. Right, so... You know, the connection between Queen Mary the first and this ghostly figure of the Bloody Mary ritual is as far as, you know, as far as everything I've been able to tell, tenuous at best. While the Queen's infamous history might align with the sinister overtones of the ritual, there's very little direct evidence linking her to the game as the origin point. The Bloody Mary of folklore is more likely a conf- a conflation of various historical and mythological figures modeled by centuries of storytelling. You know, thing that we talked about as an example before the game telephone Uh, the longer something is told the more it brings in other people's ideas other people's thoughts and this ritual was likely formed over the course of just long storytelling and not like and not directly related to bloody mary herself yeah before this bloody mary was a game in uh in the vain hopes of seeing a bloody girl in the mirror who will kill you the origin of the ritual also intertwine with ancient divination practices in various cultures Mirrors have long been considered mystical tools. 
One such practice involved young women seeking to divine their future husband's faces in the mirror. Boys, write this down in case you want to find your future wife. I bet it'll work for you too. This practice involved the young woman seeking to divine the future husband's face in the mirror. In a time when life was lit by candlelight and shadow, these rituals kind of took on a mystical air. The young woman, often on the eve of significant festivals like Halloween, would walk backwards up a flight of stairs, holding a candle and a hand mirror in the pitch dark. As she gazed into the mirror, she hoped to catch a glimpse of what her future husband's face would look like. And and then that's how you know. That's how you know who you're going to marry. Absolutely flawless. so weird. Yeah, absolutely. But not all of the visions that you could get during this divination practice were of matrimonial bliss. Sometimes you accidentally see your very loud neighbor who bothers you 15 years from now. <laughs> that would be, yeah. uh, I think I'd take that over this because you could potentially, instead of seeing your future suitor's face, you might see a skull or the image of the grim reaper might appear. And if that happened, it was deemed an ominous sign. Such a vision foretold that the woman might never marry hinting at her untimely death. And I love oh that God. back in this time, if you That's saw like, thing. it was either like, if you saw a skull, it's not because you're not, it's, it's not because you're going to die soon. You're not going to marry and then you're going to die soon. It means that you're not going to find the man you love, which is, you know, way more important. You might as then. well be, you might as well be dead. You might as well be dead. If you're not, yeah. if you're a woman who's 15 years old in 1887 and you're not married, what are you doing? Why are you wasting my time? What's the point The darker aspect of the ritual hints at the human fascination with death and the unknown elements that would later crystallize in the Bloody Mary game that we know today. I thought you were going to say in the television show, flash forward on ABC. (laughs) They're like, everybody saw three days into their future, but some people didn't see anything at all. (gasps) Were they dead? Watch next yeah, episode. The answer was yes. Yeah, yeah. That one. The answer was yes. They were dead. <laughs> Spoilers. That dude. show Fuck. ended halfway through. So it doesn't matter. There's no, there's no, there's no finale. So taking it from like the early 1900s and late 1800s, let's fast forward again to post-World War II era, particularly Alex's favorite time, the 1960s. A period. Hey, I remember hey. those great years. Those great years. Remember that when I was a kid yeah, in the 1960s? And that, that toy horse playing with a, 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 a wheel and a stick out front. Yeah, I love playing the football game where you turn on the vibrating table and the little paper men float around that are attached to pennies. You really are from 1954. <laughs> if you were there, you remember. Shout outs to you, the other old souls. You were there, you remember. I'm an X-File. Uh, I'm Mulder's uh, Civil War wife. <laughs> <laughs> is that... Is that a spoiler? Uh, I'm not even going to tell you. Like, you don't, that, that's like my least favorite episode of the X-Files. <laughs> okay, all right. All right, uh, yeah. So we're in 1960s. This is a period that's kind of marked by significant societal changes and a burgeoning interest in the paranormal and the unexplained. It's in this era that the Bloody Mary ritual, as we know it, sort of began to take shape. The cultural upheavals of the 20th century, fueled by the Cold War anxieties and the rise of horror in popular media, created a fertile ground for urban legends and folklore to kind of evolve. The ritual transformed from this, or rather, I wouldn't say it transformed, but the ritual of this divination practice sort of branched off and started becoming something else, uh, a game to for daring uh, kids and horror, a way to entertain themselves with their imagination. It felt like kids got to be more independent at this point, and so they just started getting up to like yeah. stupid kid bullshit that like their parents probably wouldn't let them do. Yeah, that, every you know de- I mean? it feels every decade, like you know, especially in this point in time, the world modernized more and more, and there was more free time for kids to be kids and not just work in farms. Yeah, they're looking to fill their time with shit to do. Uh, in high school, I always used to think like how clever it was that like kids would like skip out of class during class, like and rather than like roam the halls, they would like meet up in the bathrooms. You know, like it's sure. just, it's just the, the little things that kids do to like feel independent stick it to the man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah, no, it is. It's very interesting. Um, and, and this uh, ritual that this divination practice sort of part of it kind of branched off became this Bloody Mary thing. And the new version entailed chanting Bloody Mary in front of the mirror, usually in a darkened room, waiting for this ghostly figure to appear. This figure, now a vengeful spirit by the time the game kind of evolved into this point, was often associated with themes of blood and horror. The game tapped into the collective consciousness of society, kind of grappling with fear and uncertainty, morphing into an urban legend that sort of encapsulated the thrill and terror of confronting the unknown. And if you're kind of wondering, well, why why mirrors, though? Honestly, just look through history. Look through culture. Mirrors have been seen as portals, gateways to other realms. They're not just reflectors of our physical form. 
but are thought to hold mystical properties. The act of summoning Bloody Mary was maybe an act of daring to peer into the unknown or trying to gaze into a world that's beyond the mortal realm. And that's like a little, t- a little taster. You know, that's kind of what we're covering today. So we got four more of those. And Bloody Mary is the most, I think, most well-known one. I'm very curious if you'll have heard of. I feel satisfied. Yeah, that's satisfying, right? Yeah. So the next one I'm gonna, I want to talk about, this one you may not know or you may have. It's called The Midnight Man or The Midnight Game. The Midnight Game is like something. I Sounds don't familiar? know exactly what it is, but that's that's something the in my Midnight mind. The Midnight Man, I mm-hmm. like a great deal. You like him? It sounds it's- like an episode of Always Sunny. The Midnight Man or The Midnight Game, uh, this game cloaked in the mystery of supposed ancient pagan rites, uh, which were about ancient punishments and whispered about in hushed tones as the specter of a man scorned by the gods summoned uh, to hunt you is not for the faint of heart. That's kind of the core of the game. You summon this guy who's been scorned by the gods and he hunts you around your house until a particular time or wherever you summon him. Summon him. It's a journey into darkness, a test of endurance against unforeseen, uh, unseen forces and a temperature check for your fears. I, even if, like, I don't think I would do this because I don't need to, like, it just sounds not fun to do. I'm scared of the dark enough as it is. This is like feeds on that. Imagine, if you will, a game that begins at the stroke of midnight, a time when the world is asleep and supposedly the veil between here and the now and the there and then is at its thinnest. Is disconcertingly thin. <laughs> the midnight man purportedly has. What was that t- line of dialogue you read that is amazing? What did you say? The here and now and, the, the ver- and then the there and then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a time <laughs> Who when the are, world is. Is this asleep? for the midnight society? What are you <laughs> the doing? The midnight man, actually. No, yeah, a time when the world is asleep and the veil between the here and now and the then and there is at its thinnest. I love that. That's a line of dialogue I am going to steal. Yeah, take it, take it. Uh, the Midnight Game purportedly has its roots, like I said, in, a- in an ancient pagan ritual once used as a punishment for those who defa- dared to defy the gods. Today, it's played by thrill seekers and the bravely curious drawn to the game's weird blend of history and horror. The, rule- the rules of the game are very simple. Each step is fraught with an eerie tension. You can't fuck it up. First, you're going to write your name on a piece of paper, a sort of symbolic offering to the Midnight Man. Next, you prick your finger and add a drop of your own blood and place the paper in front of a wooden door. Light a candle, place it on the piece of paper, and knock on the door 22 times. The final knock must occur precisely as the clock chimes midnight. Those are the rules. That initiates it. That's the ritual. Then the real game begins. With the candle lit as your only protection, you must wander your darkened home, evading the Midnight Man at all costs. Should your candle... <laughs> it's like a freaking scary Game Squad game. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Eurojank horror. Should your candle go out, it's a sign that he is near, and you have mere seconds to relight it or surround yourself with a circle of salt for protection. The goal of the game is simply to survive until 3.33 a.m avoiding any encounter with this spectral entity. This is literally five nights at first. <laughs> and what do you win if you make it to 3.33 in the morning? Paycheck. Nothing. <laughs> you just get to survive. There's no win. There's no prize. Your life. You know, there's just no prize. Isn't that deep? Yeah. Uh, you get to live the rest of your life. Wow. Exciting. That's it. That's the game. He kills you if he catches you. So, you know, don't let him catch can you. He hear, can he hear you if you crouch? I I, th- I think if you crouch around a corner out of line of sight, he can't. I think yeah, this okay, is the rules cool, he cool, operates cool. by. The Midnight Man, as far as who this guy supposedly is, uh, the Midnight Man was initially used as a, supposedly as an executioner to punish those who went against the gods of the religion in question. While this religion has not been practiced for years, again, an ancient pagan religion, there is still a high risk of death or insanity to anyone who plays the Midnight Game. The the problem is, as I was looking into this origins with its roots, supposedly within ancient pagan practices, the the roots of it are about as elusive as the freaking shadows that this guy supposedly comes from. The folklore suggests that it originated as some ancient ritual, possibly used for punishment, but the original form was said to be a test of endurance and a way to seek penance through a night of fear and uncertainty, evading this malevolent entity. However, concrete, uh, concrete concrete evidence or historical documentation of these pagan rituals is super scarce 
Much like many rituals and traditions passed down through oral storytelling, the fact the exact origins of the midnight game are super murky, and this lack of clear origin only adds to the ritual's kind of mystique, painting it as a timeless test of courage and nerve. I think it was when Hideo Kojima and Guillermo del Toro got together <laughs> with Junji Ito to make a demo unlike anything the world had ever seen. Yep. And still are seeing indie games modeled after it almost 10 years later. Scary Game Squad thanks you, Hideo Kojima. <laughs> But uh, the reality of the Midnight Games popularity, it owes much of it to the rise of the internet, particularly in the early 21st century. It was on forums and early websites dedicated to the paranormal where the Midnight Game found life. These online communities began sharing detailed instructions on how to play, transforming what might have been an, ob- an obscure or forgotten ritual into a modern phenomenon. As with many kind of like let's play vibes, like where they'd like yeah. recount their little tale of the midnight forums game. that were just like, this is how I do it. This is what I did. And it would just kind of change. And again, if any of these came from an original pagan practice, it's lost. We don't know. We have no fucking idea. It could, it's the internet. It sounds like some, you know, living room mystic right. type. It really does. Shit, right. Yep. Um, as with many internet legends, the Midnight Game spread rapidly, fueled by a mix of curiosity, skepticism, and, of course, the thrill of engaging with the th- supernatural. Humans love to be scared. It was just fucking horror movies, horror video games. We do it. It's fun. It gets that shot of adrenaline. It became a staple of internet folklore pretty quickly. A game whispered about in, in forums and chat rooms and brought life to, you know, youth sleepovers and Halloween parties. Uh, in my own research, the farthest I could trace it back to was from what is believed to be a, what I believe to be rather a creepy pasta as no evidence of the tapes that the creepy pasta references could be found. It's basically simple as in two, in 2013, two teenage girls named Maddie and Tori, along with their boyfriends, Quentin and Chase, filmed themselves playing the Midnight Man Challenge on 15 different, uh, uh AVI files. During tape six, Maddie supposedly says that they have felt the occasional drop in temperature, but have not encountered the Midnight Man. In tape seven, Maddie talks about Chase's candle going out, a sign that the Midnight Man is near, forcing him to create a circle of salt on the floor to sit in, as the Midnight Man cannot enter a circle of salt, and Tori sat with him, quitting the game. Unfortunately, they brought sugar. The Midnight Man loves sugar. All of them are <laughs> he killed. He is so into that shit, especially the powdered stuff, <laughs> the good stuff, as he calls he it. He loves slurping <laughs> it up. He loves a beignet. He loves chicory coffee. He's actually quite a cozy individual, the Midnight Man. In tape eight, Maddie says that Quentin's candle went out and proceeds to mock these three dipshits who couldn't light a candle before realizing that this may provoke the Midnight Man. Mm. Tape 10 begins with Maddie going into a bedroom and commenting on how cold it's become. Her candle then goes out, causing her to panic. Luckily for her, she's able to relight her candle and continue with the game. In tape 11, Maddie talks about how she saw a figure in the kitchen, but it disappeared when she turned around. Maddie's candle then goes out because the Midnight Man is near, prompting her to to run to where her friends are and make a circle of salt around herself. Tape 12 appears to be simply the friends telling funny stories. However, at the end of the clip, a plate breaks in the kitchen, presumably caused by the Midnight Man. Can't you just picture this as like the movie Paranormal Activity kind of style? It does have the same vibe. You're literally describing like a horror, like a short, right? Like shot by shot storyboards of like a cinematically told scary story at this Mm -hmm. point. Yes, very much so. This is not how this would go down. No, we got tape 14 begins with Maddie saying that Tori left the circle in the into the camera. She then hears footsteps followed by Tori screaming in fear. This prompts Chase and Quentin to jump up and leave the circle to find her. And then tape 15 is the final tape and is described by the narrator as the most disturbing thing he's ever seen. The narrator? Yeah, again, this is um, it's, it's a narrator talking about the tapes and it's like it's Anthony I can't Hopkins. even find it. Like it's nonsense. Long ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, after reaching 3:33 a.m. when the midnight man is supposed to leave, Maddie jumps up, turns on the lights, revealing the bodies of her friends. She screams and runs out of the house, making it onto the streets before tripping. She drops the camera, and the narrator sees the Midnight Man walking towards her on the tape. And then the smash cut to credits. Yeah, yeah, and that's where the tape cuts. And that is as far back as I could find the origins of like the first mention of the Midnight Man. This is the first thing. So I think I am likely. I likely think this is a complete internet creation obviously i don't even think it has any pagan ties at all i think midnight man is an entirely 
early internet creation. The vibe of it is so creepypasta y, like just the name and everything. Yeah. Calling him like the, the goodbye man, the <laughs> bye bye, the bye bye, Mr. Bye bye. There is, I think, a movie called The Midnight Man, actually. The Midnight Mr. Bye bye. Man, I think I remember th- uh, coming across it when I was researching. Bye bye, Bean Boy, baby. <laughs> yeah, 2016, two and a half stars, The Midnight Man. It was cinemas. Robert England, Gabriel Howe, and Lynn Shea. That was the movie. Director Travis the- Zarorni. Zar- Zar- no, Zar- no Zar- no Sorry. Zarura, the, the Pokemon? <laughs> yes, yes, correct. Zarora? Yeah, yeah. The Legendary? It was written by Rob Kennedy. He wrote a separate, different Midnight Man in 2013. Are you sure it wasn't that original story you're telling us? Well, there's, I mean, I, I'm, I hope. That would be wild. No, it's not. No, this is That's not. That's like so funny, like how the internet has like its own style of like horror language like that. Like, it's called Midnight Man. And there's a character called Bloody Mary. Maybe it's like a like a Monsters Inc. kind of situation. Mm-hmm. Like it's exactly dude, he created his own like uh, yeah. cinematic universe of ritual the haunted ghosts. Yeah. Oh, the shit. Yeah. Oh, we could do something lit, with that. Right? We could definitely do something with that. Like the Boston Baked Bean Boy just sounds fun, right? But if you add internet horror and you call it like the nineteen eighty nine Boston Baked Bean Boy incident, then like all of a sudden yep. there's like a creepy pasta, there's footage Bro, now. This could be like a two a two part comic we could write. <laughs> That'd be great. The Boston Baked Bean Boy incident. Yeah. It's gotta be like all lowercase. It has to have like bad type fake, like it looks like a typewriter. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I what love it. what is the incident in said drama? There's that is one of the big questions. That's one of the big unsolved mysteries of the 1989 Boston Baked Bean Boy incident is exactly what happened. The only thing we know for sure is that any weed smoked was 100 percent legal. <laughs> Maybe it was during uh, oh, man, no, in 1989, though. So everything else is just pure speculation at true. this point. I'm going to leave it up to our more creative yeah. listeners. But did, wait, did, so did people die? What happened? It's not. Sh- no one's sure exactly. <laughs> Everyone kind records. of forgot. There man. are records. It took there place. Are records online of of a newspaper article having. We all just kind of woke up the next day. Like, what happened? I think it did. did, did yeah. Am I wrong in remembering it took place at like the the bean canning factory? Yeah, no, you're 100 percent right. There's there's no. The thing is, there's no record of a bean factory in that town. I know that's wild. Um, in all of Boston. Yeah. So unfortunately, like. It's hard to put like exact details when we're, you know, all Damn, we know, you're right. Yeah. All we know is that he's out there. I mean, I think there are rumors he came over that he, he might have even come over from England. He didn't even originate in Boston. We don't know. There are there have been some some have said that there were carvings on the Roanoke post of a little bean boy. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Some have said. I, I think I remember Jesse telling us about that in the episode about Roanoke. The carving had residual, you know, fragments in it. Of stone not found in North America. That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. He could be. He could be a su- like a like a like a be- like a like a transatlantic be- yeah. bean boy. Oh. Yeah, yeah. They say, they say they say that transatlantic on the caves of the original uh, missing links from four yeah. million years ago. Yeah, small little bean figures are on the are on those walls. I'm just saying. You think the Peruvian mummies are related to the Boston baked? The bean Peruvian boy? mummies. The thing that was crazy about the Peruvian mummies is when they opened the little coffins, there was a little recreational weed card in there. So, yep. they, so no matter what, you know for sure that whatever they were smoking, they were like a okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and it was yeah. legal. I think. Yeah, that's the main thing. Well, maybe next time I'll put the Boston baked bean boy summoning ritual. But the next one we're going to talk about is actually not. It's easy. The summoning ritual for the Boston Baked Bean Boy is easy. Uh, it's you go in the in at 12 o'clock p.m. in the middle of the day. You go with wide eyes as big as possible. And you put as many Boston Baked Bean candies in your mouth as you can. And you stare at yourself in the mirror. And without regard for what's in your mouth, you scream Boston Baked Bean Boy at the top of your lungs three times as loud as you can. You'll know you succeed when the beans spread out of your mouth and they're weed nugs and no longer Boston baked beans. Yeah, it's like a water into wine kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's and then you get a sink full of nugs. Good luck. I hope you get some good stuff. I hope he leaves you some uh, grape ape. One of my I can't favorites. wait to see the TikToks. <laughs> the next ritual we're talking about isn't the Boston baked bean boy boys. It's blue baby, blue baby. <laughs> Boston baked bean boy boys <laughs> is what you said to me just now. Yeah, yeah it is. I, I, I just came. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> 
That's just what nature said I needed to say, and I don't or I don't fight nature. No, the ritual is called Blue Baby Blue Baby. <laughs> That's more ridiculous than Boston Bank Bean Boy Boy. I'm sorry. Are you going to laugh at the Blue Baby Blue Baby ritual? I am very much laughing at Blue Baby Blue Baby because that's Blue Baby sucks. Blue Baby S- <laughs> make Jesse go crazy. No, this is a realm where childhood games intertwine with the whispers of the supernatural. Now we're going to unravel oh, a tale yeah. of Blue Baby Blue Baby, a haunting game that is echoed through. Well, I wouldn't say the corridors of time as much as the corridors of like the past two decades, leaving mm-hmm. behind a trail of the shivers corridors of Mathis's bedroom. Pretty much. I came up with this game, actually, and baby, it's not baby. what you think it's going to be. It's about a dead baby. That's blue. Is that what you're about to tell us? Honestly, you're not far off. Kind of. It's like Red Rover, except instead of living people running across, you just send dead babies across. Right. That's a, you just hop cool. dead so babies cool. at each other. Yeah. So cool. Imagine now, no, I'm going to set the scene again. You know, uh, you're in a bathroom with flickering lights where the reflection in the mirror seems to hold secrets of its very own. And here as a participant in this haunting ritual armed with nothing but your courage and a chant and bark on a chilling adventure, the words blue baby, blue baby, break the silence, each repetition, inviting the unknown into your world as the ritual unfolds and the air thickens a a sense of heaviness in a literal sense begins to fill the room. The mirror becomes a gateway to a ghostly dimension. And in this game's heart lies in its ability to conjure an unseen presence, an invisible weight growing in the arms of those brave enough to summon it. But the terror doesn't end there. The climax of the mean? spectral and encou- don't like, I'm get oh, my- oh, it- something is my hands. You are the, and you can't see it chat a uh, chat. Jesus Christ. You can't see it. Listen, I'm holding a baby. You are dead on. That is correct. But here's the thing. Why do I have? Why can't I just be like, nah, I'm good. My question. Hang on. Hold on to that thought, Jesse. All right. Hang on to that very thought. Go ahead, Alex. What are you going to say? Your question. I was going to say, if the baby is invisible, how do they know that it's blue? I'm just going to keep going. How do they know it's a baby and not a small dog? Yeah. Or a cat. Chihuahua, chihuahua. Chinchilla. Chinchilla, chinchilla. What if they named it Blue Baby and it was a chinchilla? Because well, it's it kind of got bluish fur. It's got anything, but like you say, blue chinchilla, blue chinchilla. Yeah, you could have like Why a grayish blue. blue. You can't see it. How do you know? Yeah. A chinchilla could, like, you know, Batman's. It just doesn't blue. sound as good. Anything can be blue if it's invisible. Yeah. I mean, All I right. guess. Sure. Why I mean, is it not called invisible, invisible baby? By definition, invisible it's baby. Not invisible blue, baby. Though. Come on what over. Did you think I was going to ask about the blue baby. I don't yeah. know what you were going to ask. I'm, I'm, my, my thought process ain't there anymore. So what happened? So the you want to continue? Okay, I was going to say you're going to ask. Yeah. Okay, holding. I, I, so I did. This is how you do it. The rules are simple. You're instructed to enter a bathroom, turn off the lights, and stand before a mirror. You then bring your arms up and cradle them as if you're holding a baby, and begin to chant "Blue baby, blue baby" repeatedly. Blue baby, blue baby, blue baby, blue baby. The legend asserts that if done correctly. The participants will begin to feel the weight of an invisible baby in their arms. The game, though, takes a terrifying turn as the baby supposedly becomes heavier and the mirror is said to reveal a horrifying image of its ghostly mother coming to claim her child back. However, unlike, say, the Midnight game, where the whispers of its origins are sat squarely in the lap of ancient times, Blue Baby Blue Baby is devoid of that. The true origin of the Blue Baby Blue Baby ritual is as elusive as the spectral infant in Conjures. The game, much like many urban legends, seems to have materialized from the collective fears and imaginations of society, rather than a singular historical event or tradition. The earliest I could find on this bizarrely morbid game was a supposed urban legend. Now I'm going to read through the urban legend, and you'll have hopefully all your questions answered about this ritual. According to the urban legend, a group of girls found out about the Blue Baby story and decided to try it out. They didn't believe it would work, so they sent their friend Laura into the bathroom on her own to do it by herself. You know, the thing you would send your friend to go do by herself. For- turned out, it worked. <laughs> so Laura turned off the lights, closed the door <laughs> behind her, and put out her arms and started cradling an, an invisible baby while, fr- while chanting the phrase, Blue Baby, Blue, blue baby. baby. Blue Baby, Blue Baby, Blue Baby, Blue Baby. <laughs> All of a sudden... An invisible baby feels as though it appeared in her arms and began to grow heavier. Then it began scratching at her arms. Laura was scared out of her wits and had no idea what to do. Now, what you're supposed to do in the game is exactly what Jesse said. 
Except instead of drop the baby on the ground, you're supposed to quickly put it in the toilet and flush it. What? If you don't, the mom will kill you through the mirror. If I was the mom and I watched this motherfucker take my baby and flush it down the toilet, that's when I would kill you. <laughs> well, no, if you flush it down the toilet, you sever the connection, ritual done, mommy can't get you. Oh. But what about low flow toilets, though? Well, don't, and then just, uh, I would recommend not doing the ritual. Like, if you have a low flow toilet, that's going to be like eight or nine flushes to get that Well, that's kid why down. you got to wait till the baby's super heavy, because once it gets super heavy, it'll just fl- fall right through those pipes. Yeah, then the mom will be trying to get in the toilet, trying to grab that kid, and then you'll be sitting there flushing on the mom now, and the mom's going to get more mad at you? Yeah, it's going to be tough to see, too. Baby's totally invisible. Nobody knows where he is. He's just floating around in there. Well, Laura didn't have a calm mind like you guys did. And instead, she started panicking and wanted to drop it and run, but thought that might be the be- the wrong thing to do. So she just held on to it. And she just stood there holding the invisible baby as it grew heavier and heavier. And suddenly, she caught the sight of something horrible in the bathroom mirror and screamed in terror. How terrible are we talking? Like It's the mom. It's ghastly ghoul. It's ghost mom. Angry ghost mom. When Laura's friends heard her screaming, they tried to open the bathroom door only to find that it was locked. Finally, instead of, you know, busting the door open or calling the police, they ran to a friend's house for help. When they finally got their friend, they returned and broke the door open and they found Laura lying dead on the bathroom floor. Her eyes had been scratched out and they couldn't move her body because it felt as though something large but invisible was pinning her to the ground. So did a big, did the baby like become like a big, huge baby? Like, did he become like so. an overwhelmingly yeah. large baby? Oh, yeah, does. like one of them big babies. You know yeah. what I mean? Like baby Huey? Yeah, like baby yeah. Huey? Baby Huey? Yeah. What's that from? I think, right? Am I thinking of the wrong baby? Hold on. No, you're thinking of the right baby. What baby? Yeah, baby? The, big, the big duck, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, what. okay. What's this a reference to? It's a big duck called Baby Huey. It, yeah. yeah, don't worry baby about Huey. it. Baby Huey. It's just a duck. It's a big duck. Is it a movie, a TV show? Like, I think it's a cartoon. He's got like a baby bonnet on. It's incredibly unrelevant to our times. Yeah, I don't know. Thing. I don't know this thing. You don't need to know about Baby yeah, Huey. Yeah, you never need to know about Baby Huey ever, except for this one You're moment. Never gonna, okay. It's never going to make or break you. So, boys, that's, that's Blue Baby, Blue Baby. Would you drop Blue the baby? baby? Would I drop the baby? I mean, it's like she's going to rip your eyes out if you don't flush the baby. Well, the baby's going to claw your eyes out, and the mo- ghost mom is going to kill you. Okay, but here's the question. How do you, are, are you purposefully like Blue Baby? Yes. Or can I just stand there and be like, yo, Blue Baby? No, you, you, have, to, to, you have to purposefully cradle. So you have to cradle yes. it. Yes, you have and to cradle you it. Feel, Why? If I felt with even the, the slightest bit of weight, I would be like, uh-uh, hell no. That baby would have dropped immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we putting ourselves in this situation in the first place? I'm not calling the, the lady to come kill me. I don't want to touch the baby. I kind of feel bad for the ghost mom. Well, because you're trying to impress Stephanie. Stephanie invited you to the party. It's her party. And, and it's a sleepover. And there are girls. And you're at the party. And, and she's she like, oh, you, you want to get a kiss tonight, lead. Alexander. Yeah. You, you need to, play to spin, spin the bottle. Blame me, blame me, blame me. <laughs> spin the bottle only happens after the blue baby, blue baby game. Yeah, someone's got to step up. It's going to be you, Alexander. And then she like gives you like a look, you know, like. I want you to step up, right? Jesse, you know I've been crushing on Stephanie since third grade. I can't, I can't risk it for a blue baby. Just drop the baby, dude. Just got to drop it. Yeah, she's like, I thought you were, I thought you were a little more dangerous than that, Alexander. I thought you were, tr- I thought you loved holding babies. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were into, I thought you wanted to start a family. I always thought you'd be a good parent, but clearly not. I can't believe that you weren't able to summon the spectral infant. Let's watch more scary TikToks. Uh, Jesse, would you do it for a girl? Would you go do Blue Baby, Blue Baby for a girl? I do. I do any of this for anyone. Said, I'll do anything on a, on a dare. I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, said, all right. I'll do absolutely anything. Yeah, are you kidding me? I feel bad for the ghost mom. Just I can imagine getting yanked from house to house all the time. People just stealing her baby just to flush the baby. It's fucking annoying. If anything, I would. I would try to find a way to make it worse yeah fair enough like i would see if there's a window throw the baby out if it's like a first floor and there's a window in there i'm gonna close the door i'm gonna lock it i'm gonna secretly open the window i'm gonna do the whole like blue baby blue baby and i'm gonna like start shaking stuff start doing all sorts of crazy shit and then i'm out the window 
close it up. And then when they're trying to get in, I around the back, I'm just like rapping on the glass. Gotcha. I'm doing, oh yeah, and I'm doing crazy stuff. I'm flicking, I'll, I'll cut the circuit breakers, the entire house. Oh yeah, I'm scaring, I'm scaring those kids. I'm going to lightly, I'm gonna lightly place that baby down on the sink. I'm going to just lightly place him there. And then I'm just going to start swinging my arms around like I'm in the mosh pit. Also, real talk, let's steal this mom. Like, what if I was like, hey, girl, you trying to swoop on the ghost, mom? What up? Hey, you a ghost? That's, hey, no, that's my I territory. I I'm a guy. I have all claim to paranormal and alien esque. I think I'd be a good ghost father. I think I could do it. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to be a disappointing one. They live forever. So that's or- what I'm saying. And I'd be like, hey, ghost, baby, you want to go scare some kids? The baby be like, because my baby talks. And I'd be like, OK. And then we show up at we show up at a kid's house. And then, yeah, I'd be hold, we'd be holding down their arms, freaking them out. And I'd be like, all right, Mrs. Grabber. And then they'd grab her. And then I'd be in the background like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's how we do it. Even though the ape was both imaginary and invisible, <laughs> the two men would oh, argue yeah, yeah. over who, who, which one of them would bed the ghost mom oh, yeah. for five full minutes. I don't know, dude. I don't want to be like perma ghost dad. The baby's never going to not be a baby. That's true. It's going to be a baby for eternity. And so it's, it's also a ghost. Really listen, I'll be the mom's. Listen, I'll be the mom's little side thing. You won't even know I'm there. Don't worry the about it. Mom's little side thing. That lady, got, guys, she's got no you're time gonna for that. You're going to be the baby's ghost dad. She's busy. Are you negotiating yourself into like a thruple with Jesse and the ghost? <laughs> and I don't want that. I don't want that for me. It doesn't matter. She, I don't want that. Know. It's a, she's the ghost. She can keep secrets. It's fine. Mm, no, I'm all right. <laughs> all right. We got two more rituals to get through, gentlemen. These uh, this next one, I think you might know. This is called the elevator game. Do you know or have you heard of the elevator yes, game? Yes, where you jump in the elevator? No, that's a scary game, and I hate when people oh. do that. <laughs> this, is, this is the one that's like people thought that uh, What's-Her-Name was doing it. I, I, well, yes, we'll get, we'll get to Whoa, that. Whoa, what do you mean? No, no, what? we'll get to that. Okay, okay. So this is a much more modern urban legend, a seemingly innocuous journey through the floors of a public building, which holds it within its framework a labyrinth of otherworldly possibilities. The elevator game, born from the depths of the internet, invites the daring to embark on a surreal journey, one that promises to take you far beyond the the steel doors of an elevator and into potentially another dimension. Literally the Twilight Zone ride at Disney World. (laughs) Yeah, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, It's the multiverse. Uh, The rules of the game are deceptively simple, yet each decision, each button pressed carries the rate, the weight of a ritual. Participants are instructed to enter an elevator alone and visit floors in a specific ritualistic sequence. But this is no ordinary ride. With each stop, everything gets a little bit weirder, reality seems to warp, and a sense of isolation from the world you know deepens. This ritual also kind of reminds me of the back rooms, and I wouldn't be surprised if like some back rooms might have been pulled from from this kind of thing. It's very much cut from the same cloth, like in terms of like the flavor of this shit on the internet when Ab- I read about it. It's also in Faith 3, you had to do an elevator game. Yes. Oh, just cool. like yes, this. exactly. So yeah. at the heart of the elevator game lies the rumored 10th floor, a place out of sync with our reality where the familiar becomes distorted. And it's said that if you reach this floor, you stepped into another dimension, a world tinged with the surreal and the uncanny. But be warned, returning to our world is not always super straightforward as pressing a button. Now, unlike previous games, the rules are seemingly simple at first, but for this one, quickly spiral into a web of weirdness and uh, necessary safety precautions if you were to believe it's going to take you to another world. So let me go. Let's go through it. It's fascinating. So first, to start the game, you have to be in a public building with an elevator that can reach the 10th floor. That's important. AKA the stay on main in downtown Los Angeles. There you go. Perfect. First, you go to the fourth floor. Do not proceed. If someone enters the elevator or one of the players leave the elevator, if someone does that, you have to start over, press the second floor, then the sixth floor back down to the second floor and then the 10th floor and then the fifth floor. Now, after you've done all of that, Jesse, you got a question. You're looking about to ask something. You're good. No, I'm I'm trying to visually, and I'm bad at this, visually remember the puzzle from Faith. It's almost gotcha. exactly this. I it's think. four two six two ten five. It's very similar. Yeah. After you press that, if a woman enters the elevator at the fifth floor, 
Do not look at her. Do not speak and do not talk to her. That woman is not a human being. If you do, she will decide to keep you for herself and you'll never be returned from there. If you get to the fifth floor and you're all clear on there, you then go to the first floor. What does that hold on? What does that mean? She'll keep you for herself. Good question. You'll be stuck in another dimension. Maybe her. her it sounds. Victim. It sounds scary. Well, I have to pay bills. No. Well, maybe with your soul. Right, but like what? I've always wanted to be a kept man, and I just feel like the opportunity. I've always wanted to be a kept man. Is that what you said? honestly, honestly, Jesse? Yeah. I'm. You know what? This might be it. Because who knows? This old woman. This woman might just be lonely. She could have been trapped here as well. If I disappear, I want everyone to know this is exactly what happened to me. Right. No Don't need to go look. looking for no me. Need to contact I'm the gone police. for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> so if the woman enters, don't talk to her, whatever. If nobody enters, even better. Either way, now down to the first floor again. Now, once you get here, do not proceed. Once again, if someone enters the elevator or one of the other people who are with you leave, if someone does that, you once again have to start back from the beginning. Now, the elevator will either ascend or descend. If the elevator reaches the first floor, Leave and do not look back. You're done. You won. But if instead the elevator goes up and reaches the 10th floor, leave and do not respond to the woman if she asks you, where are you going? What's wrong? Her voice will be high, like a high pitched tone when she asks that. When you're, but regardless, when you step out of the elevator, congratulations, you're now in another world. You're no longer in our reality. You're in a parallel one. If you're alone, you are in another world. Electronics will not work in this other world. This other world is identical to ours, but the two differences you'll see are all the lights will be off, and the only thing you'll be able to see from the windows is a red cross far in the distance. So that's where the back rooms part for me kind of comes in, like that familiar back rooms feeling, a place that's like, it's like our world, but empty, the lights are out, and you just see a red cross out the window way out into the distance. But you can come back to our world. You're not trapped there forever. You kind of go to visit. Check it out. Now you're there. To come back to your real world, you must go to the same elevator and press the same buttons, but only if you're leaving the 10th floor. If you're on the first floor, you're good. The, the <laughs> order is again, 4262105. And when you reach the fifth floor, Press the button for the first floor. The elevator will either again begin to ascend to the 10th floor. Uh, press uh, The elevator will again begin to ascend to the 10th so floor. So specific. I, exactly. And as it's ascending, press any other floor's button to cancel the ascension. You must press the button you can you use to cancel the ascension before you reach the 10th floor. So you just don't reach the 10th floor a second time. As you reach the first floor, check your surroundings carefully. If anything seems off, even the smallest de- detail, do not exit the elevator. If you detect something. What does that mean? You get- it means you're not in your world. You're not where you're supposed to be. It's a trick. Something's wrong. Okay. Don't exit, bro. If you detect something, like I said, do, uh, so if you detect something's wrong, resp- repeat step two until your surroundings look as they should, which is hitting the elevators in sequence. Once you're confident you've returned to your own world, you may safely exit the elevator. Then there's a bunch of other tips for what happens if you reach the fifth floor and the woman enters the elevator. Like I said, you don't look at her. You do not speak to her. She is not a woman. If you do, she may decide to keep you there. Other tips, if someone enters, someone leaves. Begin at the fourth floor if someone enters the elevator or someone leaves the elevator. Uh, Only people that leave at the 10th floor will go to the other world. Getting back to your own world may be more difficult than it seems, you may become disoriented and forget which elevator you, uh, in which you arrived. The elevator may seem to get further and further away from you as you walk towards it and so on. Be vigilant and keep your wits about you. Do not give up. If at any point during the ritual you faint, pass out, or otherwise lose consciousness, you will likely wake up in your own house. However, what? However, be sure to carefully examine your surroundings upon waking. The home to which you have been returned may not be the one you left when you first set out to attempt this ritual. You must not, in any case, attempt this too many times. This makes you susceptible to accidental slipping through the worlds. If you do not get out of the elevator on the 10th floor, or if the woman does not get in, you should head straight back down to the first floor. 
Sometimes when you're coming back, the elevator goes back up instead of down. You have to cancel the ascension by pressing any button between your current floor and the 10th to get off. The other world is trying to pull you in. And if you faint in the other world and find yourself back in your world, be careful. You can be pulled back there and uh, at any given moment. This also happens to people who have susceptible souls. I don't know what that means. <laughs> so that is like the grand structure of this fucking ritual. It is incredibly detailed. And a lot of the details are vague enough that I can see like kids, teens having like doing this and having a fun because a lot of the steps are things that are possible. Like a woman entering like open to interpretation. Yeah, Like yeah. going to the fifth floor and having a woman walk on with you on the fifth floor. Like that's not probably like uncommon to have happen, especially if you're in a public it's also, building. It's also kind of fun because it's kind of like just specific enough that you can always kind of assume that you're fucking up. Yeah. Or whatever, you know, like you could be at home and you might see something like, wait, that might not be what it is. Maybe. I'll, yeah. You can have fun with it. You can LARP with it. It's a lot of fun. It seems very SCP like uh, mm-hmm. instruction wise, like SCP 214. Then this is what it would the instructions for using this elevator, like that kind of thing. Yes. Yeah, there's also something to the like aesthetic of something very uh, complicated. Like, right. I don't know, like something about complex instructions makes it seem real. Yeah. Just the, the notion of it being so particular means, oh, somebody probably thought about this or this must be something based yeah. in reality, right? I like this one. This one's cool. Yeah. We have to use that logic even today with alien stuff, right? Whenever Reddit posts and there's something that seems very detailed and very well researched, just means somebody just. Could have just went out and did a bunch of reading before they posted it. It's very possible. But it, it, your brain is, wants to be like, oh, yeah, there's a lot of work here. Maybe it is real. But I like, I like the effort. The effort put into it, I enjoy. It, much like the Blue Baby, Blue Baby, this, this uh, can link pretty, its origin pretty much online, strictly online, rather. Likely sometime in the early 2000s internet when stories, creepypastas were kind of growing in popularity, changing and evolving. We do know it became more mainstream when media events that had eerie details could be linked online by assuming teenagers to the elevator game. And the one Alex was talking about is the one I wrote down for an example, because the one that came to my mind as well is specifically the connection between the elevator game and the specific eerie events in the media uh, with Elisa uh, or Liza Lamb in 2013. It's one of the most notable and frequently cited cases in this, in uh, this tragic and mysterious death. She was a Canadian student who was found deceased in a water tank atop the Cecil Hotel in L.A., right. a hotel with a history of criminal activity. There's a whole and stuff. Netflix documentary about it. Yeah, we have we have actual like security cam footage of her and like what she was doing. And like, it's very weird and confusing and none of it makes sense. Uh, and obviously the Internet with such a vague kind of open ended tr- crime that happened or, or t- tragedy linked it to the elevator game because she used an elevator and got confused and disoriented because she didn't know if she was in our world or hers, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, uh, that's when it kind of, I think the elevator game spurred popularity around that time. All right. The very last ritual we're going to talk about is one I had never heard of, but is another kind of modern esque ritual. The three Kings ritual. Never heard of it. Yeah, I, I figured none of you heard of that either. either. Yeah, Wait, no. what the fuck is Charlie Charlie? Charlie Charlie is a, a, a game where you ask yes or no questions to a demon, essentially. And you basically put a piece of paper down and you have a, a pencil balanced precariously on something and you have to spin it and it kind of goes to yes or no. And it'll like say whatever your answer is, whatever. And if you what? fuck it up, the demon can haunt you, I think is like the rules. It's not okay. one that we can cover it in another one. It was just an example I wanted to use. I thought people would know, but maybe you I'm threw wrong. it out. And I just, I never. It sounded so made up. That's all. Yeah, I, I, I fully believe it's real. Yeah, I just was so. I, I think thought that's you were like get around the it. time, like the Zaza or Zuzu demon like stuff around that same ritual. Pazuzu. I know that. Not Pazuzu, but Zuzu Are you Zaza, sure? or whatever. Yeah, I remember that. Okay, so the Three Kings ritual is another one that was kind of conceived in the digital era. This ritual uh, catapulted to notoriety on internet forums, capturing the imagination of those drawn to the paranormal and the psychologically profound. The ritual's premise is as simple as it is kind of spooky and unnerving. As the witching hour approaches, for everybody that doesn't know, that's uh, 3 a.m. or 3.33, depending on who you talk to, the participant sets the stage in a room of choice. A throne flanked by mirrors, dimly lit by a single candle, with darkness enveloping the edges of perception. As the clock strikes 3.33 a.m., the ritual commences. The seeker, seated on the central chair known as a throne, becomes the quote-unquote king. 
with the mirrors on either side serving as silent queens. These reflective gateways are said to reveal glimpses of other dimensions, entities, or deeper parts of one psyche. The candle, a solitary beam of light, is not just a source of illumination, but a fragile barrier between the king and the unknown. The game is played on the precipice of the mind's shadowy kind of frontiers, where the lines between the consciousness and subconscious blur. Have you guys ever put yourself in a room with like just two mirrors flanking you, especially if it's dimly lit. Yes. That shit can just yes. trip you out. Even if you're not high on anything. That Even shit- if you're in a restaurant where one wall is a mirror, it's fucking Yeah, up. it's fucking weird. It can just make it plays tricks on your minds. Uh, yeah. Participants that did this report experiences ranging from profound revelations to unsettling encounters as if the mirrors reflect not just images, but thoughts, fears, and desires. And unlike every other ritual we've covered on this episode, this one has what I would consider the clearest origin. The ritual first appeared on the subreddit dedicated to paranormal and super ne- paranormal, uh, supernatural experiences known as No Sleep. Now, for those who don't know the so- subreddit No Sleep, its one rule is you just don't ask if the story is real or not. You just assume what the people are posting is, gonna, is honest or true, the three, which obviously makes it fun and spooky for people to read it. The Three Kings ritual was initially posted by a user named Fable Forge on July 12th in a thread titled Please don't actually try this. And this is that very post. Hey, our no sleep, long time no sleep. Our no, no sleep, no, long time no see. Long time no sleep. That was my own freaking Freudian slip. Killer joke. I've been posting bits and pieces of my life here, but I find them a little boring and self-serving. The last one about the uh, juvie incidents was already like 70% made up to my shame. So today I'll post a recipe instead. This is not creepypasta, at least not yet. And I'm writing it from a train in the New York City area. What I'm about to share with you today is one of the many relatively safe ways in which you can access, but not quite enter, a place that I call the shadow side. And its effectiveness depends on how seriously you take me, so your mileage may vary. Just refer to title. I won't tell you that you shouldn't be afraid of the shadow side. Chances are you've already seen it after all and merely think it was just a reoccurring dream. I will tell you there is no need to be ignorantly afraid of it, though. There is a difference. Ignorance fuels fear, and fear can give that place a lot of juice to run on. You have to be big on preparation if you want to try this. It's like this, it's like skydiving. If getting it right on your first try is not something you're good at, then this is not for you. If you do drugs or alcohol the night of the event, you're going to have a bad time. If you're going to through some serious issues in your life and you're not feeling mentally or spiritually stable, or if you're doing this just to escape, you're going to have a bad time. And if you don't follow my instructions, particularly the multiple backups I'll give you, which trust me are there for a reason, you're going to have a really bad time. The name of this game is the Three Kings. The ingredients are simple. A very large, empty, and quiet room, preferably without windows. If windows exist, you need to be able to cover them and ensure total darkness. Basements usually work well if they're roomy enough. A pack of candles. You'll only use one if all goes well. And a lighter. And a quarter ounce of mushroom chocolate. (laughs) That's that's where I would be going. (laughs) A bucket of water and a mug. And a fan. Two large mirrors, like the one on your dresser, don't worry, they won't be harmed, or if they are, it'd be the least of your concerns. Three chairs, an alarm clock, an active cell phone, don't forget to charge the goddamn battery, a loved one willing to follow rules and go along with all the madness, a small toy or dear object from your childhood. So that's what you need to start. That's that's your list of ingredients. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll get this up on the show notes for people. The setup is simple. You start setup at around 11 p.m. Place one chair in the center of the room facing north. This is important. Place the other two chairs exactly to the left and right facing your throne. The distance between your throne and that of your queen and fool should be about the length of your arm to each side more or less. So you can have a queen on one side and the other chair is supposedly for your fool. Place the two large mirrors on the queen and fool chairs left and right of you facing you and each other. Try your Question. best. Time out, time yep, out, yep, time yep, out, time yep. out. For clarity's sake, the throne is separate from the chair facing north, or are they the same thing? The throne is the chair facing north. All and right. then the two chairs okay. on your left and right within arm's reach, queen, fool, mirror on each chair that Great. are facing this you. seems meticulous, but I'm on board. Yep. Try your best to have them stand at a 90 degree angle, or else you may or get more or less than three kings. If you sit on your throne facing <laughs> straight ahead, north, you should be able to perceive your own reflection each of the two mirrors without actually having to turn your head nor your eyes to do so. What do you mean more than three kings? We'll get to it. Let him, let him, oh, let the po- okay. let him cook, man. Let him let him cook. Spooky. That's what the, that's what you know. He's, he's working on it. If you see your own reflection in the corner of your eye, just barely there, then you've done it right. Place the bucket of water in the mug in front of you, just barely out of reach. 
place the fan behind you, turn it on. Don't set it to maximum powder, a powder. Don't set it to maximum power. Medium or low is usually enough. Leave it on. Turn off the lights, leave the door open and go to your bedroom. Set the candles by the side of the bed next to a lighter, your alarm clock and your cell phone. Leave it charging. Set your alarm clock for 3.30 a.m. Turn off the lights and sleep while holding your power object. Get some rest. Then it's showtime. Wake up at 3.30 a.m. with your alarm clock. Turn it off, but don't turn on the light. You have exactly three minutes to light your candle, grab your cell phone, and make your way to the dark room to sit in your throne. You should be seated by 3.33 a.m. Don't forget your power object. Check for potential red flags. If your cell phone didn't charge for whatever reason, abort the mission. If the alarm clock didn't go off at exactly 3.30 a.m., abort the mission. If you find the dark room door closed, remember you left it open, abort the mission. If the fan is turned off, you left it turned on, abort the mission. Side note, if you have to abort the mission due to any of the above, leave the house with your loved one, go to a hotel or something. There's no need to run. You have time to grab your jacket and your keys and whatnot, but leave. After 6 a.m., the coast should be clear. If all is going as planned, you can proceed to take your throne. Do not look directly at either of the two mirrors you put beside you. Do not let the candle go out. The fan is behind you. You must protect the candle with your body, which is standing in between. There's a reason for this, as you'll soon see. Look straight ahead at the darkness, not at the candle, not at the mirrors, just straight ahead. Eagle-eyed readers surely noted, noticed, I didn't say during setup, which chair was queen and which chair was fool. That's because it's your job to find out. And from their point of view, you are either their queen or their fool too. Hence, three kings. I won't spoil what happens next. Suffice to say, you won't be alone. And if you have any questions, you'll get answers. Sometimes in the form (laughs) of new questions, but hey, that's the story of humanity. Just stay put. Yeah, just stay put and try not to move. Again, do not look directly at the mirrors nor the candle. Just straight ahead. Trust me. Don't chicken out either. You need to wait until 434. By 434, it's all over. It's okay to tremble a little bit. Just try not to. Not because it affects the ritual or anything. It's just a pussy thing to do while in polite company. <laughs> just, just be, be, don't, don't tremble in front of your loved one. Don't be a bitch. Did I mention not to let the candle go out? That's what the fan is for. You're protecting the candle with your body, but if your body were to be suddenly moved, then the fan would turn the candle off. That's backup number one. Your loved one is backup number two. At 434, she has to come in the room and call your name. If that won't work, she has to call your cell phone. If that won't work, she has, she has the glass of water in the bucket. She can't touch you, though. That's a newbie mistake. Backup number three is your item of power, the toy or locket or whatever object of strength you brought along for the ride. It'll show you the way out. Uh, multiple backups. You got to be like a Boy Scout if you do these things. If you half-ass it, half-ass it all the way so that it won't work. Worst you can do is take it. Worst you can do is take it seriously enough for it to work and not seriously enough to be prepared for the consequences. If in doubt, refer to title. And that's the post. There you go. So yeah, the, can, the, the, the fan is a backup to blow the candle out in case you were moved. You know, cell phone, same thing. Uh, and that's the Three Kings uh, ritual. It's, a, it's called Three Kings because I guess you're, you, on your left and your right are like portals to other dimensions where other people are doing the same thing or other versions of you are doing the same thing. And uh, you looking into the darkness, your questions should be answered. And if you fuck it up, he never, ever, ever specifies what happens. Like if you do it wrong, remember, like, uh, like you said, just leave the house. He just said, leave the house. Don't know why. Don't know what that means. He never, ever specifies. But that gentlemen is the, I would say the most modern of these five rituals, the three Kings. What do you think? Would you perform Delightful. three kings? It's a lot of work, honestly. I don't think I would do it just because it's a lot of work. It, see, it seems, yeah, it seems almost like a little bit. This one feels like they made it so complex that nobody would ever do it. The elevator one, I was like, I would do this. I would like go fuck around and try this. This one, it seems so imaginary. Yeah. That, that, it, that it's just. Well, even at the very top, like, he says, a, remember. Almost like a story, more like a short story than a real thing. And he even says at the top, like, and whether you believe, like, how much you believe this to be true will affect it. Like, you know, lots of wiggle room for it to fuck up. Lots of little things to fuck it up for it to not to work properly. But that's that's the Three Kings ritual. And boys, that's the first uh, potentially only episode on ritual hauntings. Uh, some familiar, some non. And uh, there's there's a ton of them out there. I have a whole list of ones I was going to go do if we didn't have enough time. Uh, we got things like uh, uh, you got the Hooded Man ritual. One Man Hide and Seek, The Picture Game, Charlie Charlie Challenge, you know, the stuff that uh, 
really excites Alex, particularly Charlie Charlie. I'm just flabbergasted by the name Charlie Charlie. <laughs> I can't believe that I'd never heard of it before because I feel like I would remember it. Uh, and it was from 2015, by the way. 2015 is Charlie Charlie. Vibes. So, uh, but that's it, boys. That's on. That's it for us. That's it for 2023. We're done for the new year. Thank you guys so much what for a delight. being here with us all through 2023, uh, allowing us to be the thing you listen to every week to keep you company. All your support on Patreon has been crazy. It's only grown. And we appreciate you for allowing us to kind of grow our project and grow the show along with you. And uh, we're really excited for 2024 as we enter year six of Chaluminati podcast. And we have just more ideas and more stuff coming. Uh, Enjoy your holiday. Enjoy your new year. Stay safe. If you're going to get drunk, stay safe. Get an Uber and uh, kiss that person, you know, whoever they are. Kiss that person. When the ball drops, grab their balls and give them a kiss. That's what Jesse's going to do. I'm going to I'm going to kiss Jesse. On New Year's. I don't even see how it's possible. You're going to fly here and kiss him? I can't. I'm not possible with the Three Kings ritual. I love that. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode here. And uh, we're going to head over to patreon.com slash IluminatePod to do a mini-sode right now. Bless you. Uh, Thank you again. Bless you. And that's it. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye. Texas shit. Shit from Saturn. Poop from Uranus. <laughs> I wanna paint no mind, but it came a straight line. Came a straight line. Came a straight line. It was four gray little men, and they came from my behind.